Now available in podcast feeds. Don't miss your chance to join three friends as they unpack movies from their childhood. I'm just going to watch you die. What was this film rated again? PG. And decide just how traumatic they were. That is how long they're stabbing him. I giggled through that scene because it was so uncomfortable and weird. In Clamshell Case Files, starring the bad boy of podcasting, Quentin. I mean, if my dog killed another dog, I would protect him by burying that body, but I would never kill the dog myself. Girl Friday, Bridget. I just want to apologize to Samantha Mathis that I have been maligning her breasts for the for decades. For the and America's sweetheart, Matt. Where a yeah. giant toy elephant is blowing snow out of its hooter mm. nose oh, yes. thingy Trunk. all over it's the building. <laughs> You're invited to share in the magic of clamshell case files. Available wherever you download podcasts. anything once again and yet i jumped full into it welcome to jukebox zeros where your idols come to die i'm lels and i'm patrick hey i'm here too and i didn't have anything either but like who cares 70 episodes in we don't have to put on a face anymore yeah we you you know our thing if you haven't accepted it at this point then what the hell i mean shame on you at this point if you're still (laughs) listening at this point and you're like these guys are are boring and they ramble too much uh, I bet they get better by the next one, though. I, I'm when gonna, are I'm they going to start truth. talking about Doug Garouge again? What I happened? thought this was a Doug Garouge podcast. <laughs> yeah, remember Doug Garouge? Remember 2018, guys? Those, those were the good old days. Uh, yeah, welcome to changed. Season- <laughs> welcome to season four. We're stupid jerks now. A trench full of urine. I'm so mad at all five of my dads. Straight from the duck. Please, it's Dumpsterton. Tell us more about the history of clowns. That's fuck. That, that's girls. Give Santa some dome. Roadhouse. They took away my children, and now I have boxes. Bob Zombie, Harold Manson, and Ned Durst. My dear ankle stinky. I'm going to become Billy Ocean now. He's positively croggy. Don't forget to eat your school. Now that's what I call Market Basket. <laughs> forgot about that one i got i got scared at first before we started recording because i thought oh crap i don't think i came up with a tagline from the last episode and then i opened my document file and just there it was just going yes this is this is how today is going to go this is the one i'm, I'm giving you a break that that was jesus looking down on you and saying lils i got you those those <laughs> pair of sandals that you saw or, or a pair of footprints <laughs> that you saw in the the snow that was me that that was when I was also footprints <laughs> but but if your footprints uh when is uh how is phone <laughs> but who was phone my name is blue sky is back yay <laughs> <laughs> yeah from our uh, Fair- human after all episode very quickly building himself up to be our new our resident electronic album specialist in a sense in a sense what can i say um i love electronic music i mean i i got you there i mean if there's one thing that i ever since my childhood you know seeing fat boy slim chemical brothers the prodigy all make their way into mtv you know that, that was a channel you know for the time Right. Uh, I just got into, I was a rock and roll kid. You know, I, I was always about rock, punk, you know, maybe some metal if it's good, some grunge, whatever was rock, I was listening to it, even if it sucked. Mm. You know, but it's, if it sucked too much, I wasn't listening. So I knew my tastes, um, but <clears throat> that quickly changed the moment that electronic music came into play. I'll be honest, that's kind of what got me, like, so into electronic music, too. Like, it was a very sort of 
tentative transition where like for the longest time the only electronic music i would accept was ones that sounded quite a bit like rock music which probably ties very well into the artist we're going to be talking about today uh before before we do though should we get into the apology section because i actually have a doozy to discuss before we get into the album yeah all right here's the apology section You got, you got anything to apologize for, Pat? Because boy, do I. Uh, sorry, I'm stimpy today. I got, I got to uh, take a bath. Okay. <laughs> you heard it here, folks. Pat is sorry he's stimpy. <laughs> so I have to apologize, on be like I have to apologize to my girlfriend and partner Seuss because our previous episode. The uh, Captain Beefheart one almost got her in trouble at work. So she was listening to the... She likes to listen to the podcast when she's working. She works at a supermarket. And uh, at one... Like, when it got to the point where it played the clip of Magic Bee... You remember that song? The very hippy-dippy sort of... I'll give you a magic flower. Sort of hippy burnout song. Oh, yeah. No, the Magic (laughs) Bee. Yeah. About the Magic Bee. (laughs) <laughs> flies around. Yeah, go, go, go As, on, like, a knee-jerk reaction, as soon as that started happening, Seuss just sort of said out loud, Filthy hippies! And then turned to behold a white woman in dreadlocks with a tie-dye, with a tie-dye tank top just staring right at her. <laughs> That's what happened. I couldn't have written that. That. She just, she just sort of went, uh, sorry, I was, uh, and then had to go hide in the freezer for a while. Oh man! Well, I mean, I guess, I guess we we did we we evoked that out out of Sue's, so uh, I suppose so. But yeah, I guess we are to blame for that. Uh, I'll, mm. I'll, I'll I'll take the hit for that. Uh, sorry, I, I mean, mean fortune, I picked the fort- album, so I guess it's, it is my fault directly. The, the good news is, like, it didn't, like, get her in trouble, like, with her boss or anything like that. Because I guess the woman was just sort of like, what happened? And just went on her way. But what I think would have been hilarious is if, like, she happened to come back another day and Seuss just greeted her in the most chipper voice. Hi, filthy hippie. <laughs> good morning. How are you today, filthy hippie? <laughs> yeah, I get that a lot. Uh that's actually, it is my birth name. Your birth name is Filthy Hippie? That, that's what the woman says. Oh. Yeah. Uh, it's actually Filth Hippie, <laughs> uh, but she likes to go by Filthy. Everyone's got a nickname. Uh, should we... <laughs> they sure do. I remember the days when there used to be Filthy Hippies, and nowadays everyone wants to split it apart. Why does everyone want to be so divisive? <laughs> Yeah, why are there so many that actually take showers now? That's some hippies are filthy, some hippies are grody. Yeah, make the the crisp and the crusts unite. <laughs> Just mash it together like a couple of really soft saltines. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> oh, how about music? How about we'll be, we'll be get together to talk about the music? Yeah, the let, rock and let, roll. let's yeah, let's keep this a music <laughs> podcast because we actually got a timetable this time. All right, if you have so much as a passing familiarity with the resurgence of electronic dance music that occurred in the '90s, chances are good you've at least heard of the Prodigy, uh, the brainchild of DJ Liam Howlett and home to frequent collaborators Maxim Reality, Leroy Thornhill, and the legendary frontman Keith Flint. The Prodigy defined themselves early on as innovators in the realms of breakbeat and hardcore techno, but would later help define the subgenre of big beat music with their 1997 mega hit record, Fat of the Land, famous for containing staples of 90s electronica such as Firestarter and Breathe. Uh, Fat of the Land was a massive commercial and critical success, but their transition from the 90s into the aughts was a rough one. 
Uh, by the end of 1999, longtime member Leroy Thornhill departed from the group, and the Prodigy's website went silent. They would reemerge in 2002 with a new single, Baby's Got a Temper, that would be released to intense negative reception from critics. The track was in a similarly edgy vein to controversial Prodigy singles like Smack My Bitch Up, and was intended to be part of a new record of Prodigy songs, but its failure led Howlett to believe that he needed to change directions. <clears throat> Uh, the intended record would be scrapped and Howlett set to work writing a new one. 2005's Always Outnumbered, Never Outgunned. The album set itself apart from previous Prodigy releases in that Keith Flint and Maxim Reality made no appearance on any tracks, instead deferring to a crowd of guest vocalists, including rappers Cool Keith and Twista, actress and singer uh, Juliet Lewis, and even the Gallagher Brothers of Oasis, among many others. Critics were unimpressed, and reviews ranged from middling to outright negative. To this day, it's ranked as one of the Prodigy's least beloved full lengths. Very few tracks would be performed live after the initial tour for Always Outnumbered, Never Outgunned. And many fans would consider the record the start of a nadir for the group that wouldn't correct itself for nearly a decade later. What about, what about us? That's what we're here to do. To listen to Always Outnumbered, Never Outgunned. Yeah. Uh, before we get into, like, the tracks itself, um... Pat, you're at kind of a disadvantage this episode, because by your own admission, you're not very well, like, informed on the Prodigy. Yeah, I, I think, in general, that uh, that era of electronic music, I kind of just slept on. Uh, I was maybe 13, yeah, I was 13 when Fat of the Land came out, uh, and the singles were, like, Breathe, uh, Firestarter, Smack My Bitch Up were pretty popular on radio and MTV at that time on BCN, WBCN, which was like a, like our, our local alternative rock station. But I mostly listened to AAF, which was kind of like a more straight ahead rock and metal station. And they always kind of had like shitty things to say about BCN's tendency to like, uh, start adopting the, you know, what was obviously very, uh, popular trend of electronic rock type music and, and shit like fat boy swim. And yeah, I'm like, I don't know. Was, of course it was always kind of like rock purist based that, and, 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 you know, a little bit homophobic really as well. Uh, just, you know, because of, you know, for whatever reason. Uh, but like, I think like by the time I started, you know, moving away from straight ahead rock and like getting more, you know, becoming more informed in different genres of music, including electronic music, I felt like the shit from like 97 sounded kind of dated because uh, there was like a really, which I'll get into when we listen more to this album, because uh, there was like a, for me, like a pretty strong shift uh, sometime in like the early to mid 2000s and like how that shit was arranged and produced and everything uh yeah just yeah for for uh i i've heard fat of the land i listened to it uh in anticipation for this episode and like it's you know production techniques and shit are you know undeniable and obviously really cool arrangements and everything and just musically i don't think it's ever really ever going to be for me mm. and there's that's nothing wrong nothing wrong with that personally like uh Fat of the Land is one of like is one of many albums that got me into electronic music. It's one of my favorites, even though I kind of believe some of the, you know, predilections towards too edgy for school may not have aged quite that well. But the actual production itself is kind of, you know, hard to hard to deny. Uh, how about you? Uh, how about you, Blue Sky? Do you have any uh, big experience with the Prodigy leading up to this? Well. As I told you, when I was a child, I only ever listened to the singles. And because I enjoyed rock music, seeing something like Keith Flint and Maxim Reality just go completely bonkers in videos like uh, Breathe and Firestarter, like, I, I was hooked. I'm like, I, I, want, I want more of this. I want more of this. Yeah, the, I think that's what, electro what got electronic music in out. What um people who like rock music don't seem to understand is that there are plenty of genres who can just take your energy or apply <clears throat> a rock energy uh to anything that they want so if rock either refuses to innovate or refuses to really 
integrate uh, that sort of energy, that, that true spirit, um, then there's a whole lot of people who are looking to not only add that to their music, but use it as a means to innovate. That's, re that's exactly why Fat Boy Slim's music, it's not, rock, uh, there's nothing rock about that music, but um, they know how to, Normal Cook knew how to put on a show, knew how to make the kind of music that can really like bring all the kids and just make them party. Uh, Chemical Brothers uh, had music that uh, borrowed a bit from psychedelic rock. Like they were the electronic artists that had a little bit of a psychedelic rock influence. So if there's anything that uh, gave electronic music an, advan an advantage is that they were always about the future. Um, electronic music is always about trying to build the sound of the future, which means that if rock did not innovate, did not do anything, there are other genres who are willing to take what, you know, a little bit of rock mojo mm. and, you know, really throw some punk energy, some rock energy, some psychedelic energy, and, you know, make something truly innovative and vital. Mm. So that's what, I think that's what caught me. You know about Aphex Twins Come to Daddy. Oh, apparently, yeah. come, apparently come to Daddy was made by uh, Richard James Need to try and see if he can make an electronic version of a metal song. I can absolutely see that. Like, right, like, especially if you've seen the music video for it. And, like, to build on what you were saying about, like, you know, Chemical Brothers incorporating Psychedelia and uh, Fat Boy Slim incorporating, like, this, like, of the stuff that he incorporated, I feel like the Prodigy brought kind of a like brought kind of a punk rock sort of sensibility to electronic music especially once they started you know digging into fat of the land and keith flint got his chance to really you know spread his keith flintness all over the place and like i was thinking about this earlier because i was running some errands before we met but in a way prodigy kind of sort of opened doors for a lot of similar like electronic groups that also are kind of rock groups like acts like uh acts like pendulum or or disco biscuits or you know djs like zardonic and that sort of stuff like they definitely open some paths for them i would say even bands uh, such as does it offend you yeah oh totally there's yeah that that whole like dance punk music had to have been highly influenced by the prodigy i got prop i for sure Okay, okay, so, so we've, we've been, been doing, doing all this talking, talking about, about the Prodigy. Prodigy. Should, Should we, we get, get into, into the, the album? album? Yeah, let's do it. Let's let's dive in. Uh, if you dive want in. to, I was going to go ahead and talk about the title. You think I should go ahead and save that anecdote for like in the middle of a couple songs? Uh, sure. I mean, we got the whole album to. We'll, we'll undoubtedly be talking about the Prodigy throughout the whole thing. So let yeah, let's just get into the songs. We got track number one titled Spitfire. <laughs> This one uh, features vocals by Juliet Lewis with backing vocals by uh, Natalie Appleton of All Saints. Um, it was released as the last single from Always Outnumbered, Never Outgun, and peaked at number 107 on the UK singles chart. And, I mean, I can't really speak to how much this continues throughout the record, but, like, right out the bat, there is definitely a through line here between this and, you know, previous Prodigy songs, to be sure. There is, all I have to say is that it's a very, well, it's not all I have to say. Um, it's a really, really strong beginning. Like oh, yeah. the, <clears throat> that rock and roll energy I told you guys about that we all kind of felt throughout the music, they brought it with that song. I absolutely agree, because it just like, just starts right on a dime with just this big ripping power chord. And like just just immediately, as soon as you hit play, it's just. It feels like not just an album opener, but also a concert opener in many ways too, just because of this huge rush of energy that just builds up and then just explodes, as soon as it gets to like the main breakbeat. That's what we um, wanted from rock music, you know, just this ability for music to just you know, 
build up if you want to or not, but you no, know, punch us in the fucking face with the music. That that is exactly what it did. As soon as you pressed, you know, play, it's like one chord just completely like oh oh mother <laughs> shit damn. Mm. Um, it doesn't rock doesn't always have to do that, but uh, it contributes to our perception of rock that it does that and to carry that throughout the whole entire song throughout the whole whole entire first track you know that with that song you know there were some expectations Mm. there were some expectations in terms of whether or not they're going to be keeping up this energy i mean they're the prodigy you know you there's no weak track in the prodigy I'm sure there is, but the whole point is that is that the music, dis- if it doesn't punch you in the face, it disorients you. It, it, it does what rock and roll is apparently mm. supposed to do, at least, you know, for anybody who has this perception of what rock music is or what it sounds like, like this is it, that, that mm. is it. The only difference is it's an electronic track and <clears throat> anybody who had been looking for that that's it you know they they have it right in their hands you look like you've got something that you're that you're waiting to add pat <laughs> yes th- thank you thank you for those unbiased takes guys no th- this was uh this was a toe tapper sure uh and you know i i think like i i just listen to fat of the land so i could hear the through line uh could even hear some like similar instruments happening and obviously that like big break beat uh beat is happening uh which is like for me i i it's like on most of their songs uh and it was uh interesting <clears throat> excuse me uh interesting that juliette lewis popped in uh, yeah, I wouldn't have pegged her for a singer. So she was, I, I think, like doing some uh, vocals for for like various bands in the L.A. area, like even in like the late 80s, early 90s. But or, uh, and then, yeah, she was kind of like doing some random things in the early 2000s. Uh, yeah. So th- this kind of tracks with, with her trajectory at this point that she was kind of like taking a break from acting and, and doing some some stuff in the studio uh yeah and, and, and like she sounded good she she fit in what they were doing did you guys hear any song from her band Juliet and the licks i haven't i might check it out like i really should have checked this out in preparation for it just out of curiosity but i don't know like yeah i don't know just checking out like the bands of celebrities has usually not been something on my radar that much or like the bands of actors. All I have to say is that right around 2001, I believe this, that's when this album was released. Um, Garage Rock was making its way in. Oh yeah, um, that's true. That's yeah, when you the had strokes, you know, the white stripes, the hives. So Juliet and the Licks would most like, from what I've heard, Juliet and the Licks would most definitely fit right in. They, they would <laughs> fit right in with the whole, you know, Garage Rock, you know, the pastiche of you know. Rock were, artists should, you know, they were a very garagey band. Like they're going to kick your ass and all that stuff. Mm. All right, so should we move on to track number two? Yeah, you think? Let's, let's listen to Goyle. Uh, Featuring the ping pong. Yes, track number two. Oh, I love those dames. <laughs> track number two, as Pat called it, Goyles. kind of a shift from like just that punch in the face rock of Spitfire but I mean you can't expect an electronic group not you know to get crazy with the like electronic bleepity bloops yeah, I'm not gonna lie I kind of like that synth line the beep, 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 beep. It yeah it's pretty good the, the strong bread strong bad brave I hadn't thought of that good but shit. I suppose it is this was the first single off of Always Out Number Never Out Gun 
Uh, as you mentioned, it features additional vocals from the Ping Pong Bitches. And uh, it's uh, based around samples of uh, Style of the Street by Broken Glass and You're the One for Me by D-Train. Yep, so that's happening. Um, something about the sound of, like, girls in particular reminds me a lot of, like, like 80s electro music. Like, maybe it's the way, like, the beat's set up, but I get very heavy kind of mantronic -y sort of vibes. You know, that, that era of, like, 80s electro music where it was kind of hip-hop, but it was also kind of house music as well. Just kind of, just kind of dancing the line yeah. in between. Um... Yeah, I don't know what to think about this one. It it is kind of a very weird <clears throat> shift in energy at this point. Like you really came out of the gate, you know, kicking down the doors, but with the you know now that you show that you're wearing some Adidas track suits here, um, it it's very <clears throat> it's a weird um, juxtaposition. But I mean, the song. <clears throat> I would still say that like that energy of like kicking down the door is probably still there, but the mood has definitely, you know, changed it's, from like it's chilled. Maybe even like just to keep the rock metaphors going, like the first one might have been like in the realm of like metal or like punk music. This one seems downright glam in a lot of ways. Yeah, a yeah, it's it, it's a little less distortion. I mean, there's definitely still distortion happening. It's still uh still big beat factors happening but yeah i could see that there there's uh the synth sound like a bit cleaner if that well, i, I wasn't even necessarily thinking about like you know the cleanness or dirtiness or distortions of the synths or anything like that so much as like this kind of general theme of like you know girls partying all around the world sort of thing that you know you just heard non-stop in glam metal during the 80s oh sure yeah so just to give a little bit of context um when this album came out in 2004, like, I was, I was, yeah, I was still in high school. I was very, very jazzed for it just because of how much Prodigy I'd previously, you know, taken in. And, uh, like, front to back, when I got this record, like, when I first heard this single, I think it was played on WFNX the first I heard it, and I definitely thought it seemed strange. But I, w I was willing to roll with it. And, uh, like, like it, it kind of grew on me when I was younger. But now, you know, with the, after the passage of time and all that sort of stuff, I'm not sure it's really hitting the same way it did when I, you know, was first exposed to it. Because, like, I feel like there are certain parts on the album that have a tendency to meander a little bit. Like, I mean, it doesn't really happen so much for the first couple of songs, I would say, but... As you go on, some of the songs get less and less tight. Yeah, that's a pretty common uh, sentiment for. Uh, were you, did you like? Uh, did you remember this album coming out? Did you like? Were you a fan before this record came out of the Prodigy? So this is like something you're anticipating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why. It, that's why I was that level of excited for it, and I may have been like clouded by just my own fandom to just be willing to forgive yeah. some of the blemishes on this it's a super but, common thing with with uh i don't know uh with you, you with with like fans and, and then like they the first album that comes out like while they're a fan like the first one that like they anticipated and uh they they get very like emotionally tied to that album in, in a lot of ways uh either you know negatively or or positively usually positively and you're you're willing to like forgive uh you know the the, the meandering aspects of it uh until like years later you kind of revisit it and be like yeah maybe this is not quite as compelling as i thought it was but at the time it was just great to have a new record from them because you know especially since these guys were spending like how many however many years on it uh five six years yeah i mean we'll get further yeah we'll get further into it as we go as we go deeper into the album but uh should we move on to track number three for now, you think? or Yeah. Sure. All right. Here's track number three, Memphis Bells. <laughs> so 
So I think this song is kind of awesome. Memphis. <laughs> Memphis. <laughs> Like, not just because it just really hits very well with just that very thick, bassy synth and those hard-hitting sort of kick drums, but I'm really a fan of, like, all the just wild swings that are being taken on this one. Because, like, during that clip when uh, that sample of the bells came up, I could see Pat just kind of get a little bit of a grin, like, oh, they that's what they did. And, like, I think that's kind of cool. And there's definitely a lot of wild swings being taken on this album like as it goes onward like for for me like the peak of it is when it hits that bridge and it's just cuts everything out there's just that one synth going da, na, 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 na. <laughs> that that feels like a friggin mosh pit moment yeah imagine if you were for sure if you were at a live show that came on and that breakdown happened it's, it's i imagine it would be like dangerous like to even be around that space hmm at least that's that's what I feel like um, Prodigy wanted us to feel the moment that they added that breakdown. Like now the music is just, whoo, it, it, it really um, <clears throat> gets you going. But what's supposed to happen after this breakdown? Yeah, uh, I, I, I dug this track too. I thought that it was a lot of fun. And it was the first like, uh, it's like a dub beat. That go that goes on in this one. It's like a bit of a different tempo. It's not uh, that that same kind of jungle uh, uh, break beat that that they use they utilize in a lot of their songs. Uh, yeah, and I kind of appreciated that break. And yeah, there's a lot of uh, <laughs> yeah, a lot of swings being taken, a lot of kind of dangerous things happening. And yeah, it's just kind of like it's like that perfect blend of of like sexy and obnoxious, and just like the right level of it that kind of like goes over it to be like, yeah, this, this like, I mean, it, it, it's dirty, but yeah, it slaps for sure. You can kind of hear like the early beginnings of a lot of like future subgenres of electronic music too. Like particularly in like the real, just the dirtiness of like those bass synths, like, you know, the American dubstep movement, like Skrillex and all the rest, there's no way that oh, they sure. didn't yeah, pick some of that like up. Good, probably, uh, you know, six seven years before dubstep started to take off yeah like the the skrillex acts and shit like that so these guys were probably pulling from like real actual dub uh which you guys would have more of a knowledge on that than i would, ever would but i know that it its roots are, are like a good 10 years before 2011 words on princess superstar yeah guest vocalist princess superstar Any of y'all familiar with her i am not familiar with her unfortunately is that is that someone I need to look uh, at? Yes, and I would highly recommend her album, uh, My Machine. It's just like a really dope concept album about the that is wrapped around, you know, superstardom. I mean, she's Princess Superstar. She's one of those artists that really takes the concept of being a superstar, sometimes you know, put it in a way that is cartoonish or tries to really live it and tries to use that yeah. as the selling point the, um, the, the way that Naga approach which, which yeah is like, i was about to say yeah, yeah. yeah i was about to say the way you were describing it it sounded kind of like a proto yep, lady a Gaga singer a um, rapper um yeah I, I think most people would try and point you towards her album is but i point you towards my machine because it's a really <clears throat> Sorry for the cops. It's a really tight um, concept album about, you know, fame and the need to try and really disengage, you know, what is it? The cult loyalty to celebrity. Mm. Oh, sure. That's it, sort it's of... best. And it's supposed to be set in like a couple of years into the future. Mm. it's oh, it, it's yeah it's much better if you just listen mm. to it because i don't think i'm doing my best to describe it as someone who has heard it once and really enjoyed it after that but i think this is an album that you have to hear for yourself but once you do it it's like mind-blowing yeah i'll have to remember that um should we move on to track four you think yeah yeah i, I think we said all we had to say about the murph birth murph <laughs> All right, track number four, this one titled Get Up, Get Off. (laughs) 
again, this one kind of rules. Yeah, we got Juliet Lewis back too, and then and Twista. Yeah, some really really stellar like lyrical turns from Twista right there, which really kind of puts like I'll get into it when we get into it, but it puts another collaboration further down, kind of to shame in many ways. But like I like I like a lot of the same things that are happening here that were on like Memphis Bells, that sort of really really sort of stop start breakbeat sort of noises and things like that. And it just like I get I don't know, just Twist and Prodigy just seems to work really well together. Like as yeah. you could hear from yeah, that. I like clip. how kind of grungy those choruses get too. It's pretty it's uh was kind of unexpected. I, I appreciated it. Mm. So that was the uh, fourth song off of Always Outnumbered, as Never Outgunned. As we mentioned, it featured Twista, who also co-wrote the song, Juliet Lewis also, and uh, Shahin Badar, who I did not look up who that is. A English singer-songwriter who is best known for her vocals on the Prodigy single Smack My Bitch Up. Oh, all right. Ah, so she's a frequent collaborator with them, I yeah, guess. Yeah, I guess so, and I, I did not know who did the vocals on that track, and now I know. Oh, the uh, that's like now the we, like the kind of Middle Eastern breakdown that happens in the middle, probably. Yeah, that yeah, that that, that little part before it just gets right back into yeah. it. All I have to say is yes. Anybody, <laughs> um, being a person who you know would listen to almost any music as long as it sound good, I was familiar with Twista, you know, but probably wasn't familiar until. I think Kamikaze is the name of one of his albums. Yeah, that that might have been his one. That might have been his one big album. I don't know if he really had too many hits after that. Or oh not. yeah, that was the one with Celebrity Overnight on it, right? Yeah, Overnight he was known Celebrity as one of the Overnight. fastest rappers uh, in history. Guinness, um, I think Guinness. Yeah, five hundred and ninety-eight sim- syllables in fifty-five <laughs> seconds. Wow, here we go. In nineteen ninety-two, that's insane. Yeah, he's he's kind of legit. I, I wow, I enjoy Twista. So to see him and Prodigy get together, I'm like, uh, oh, yeah, this makes sense. This makes a lot of sense mm. for, yeah, for them you're... to get together. And uh, it's safe to say he really held his own on the album. You know, there was no way, uh, Twister and Prodigy, there was no way, there's no way that he could lose. You just sort of assured greatness with that combination in many ways. I'll, I, I sh- I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to look Twista back up because he just sort of came at a time when I wasn't into hip hop yet. And now, like that, I am, now that I am into it and checking out all these artists that came around the time when I wasn't into it, like clips and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, I, I, I need to look him up later. All right, should we get on to track number five? Yeah, we got another track with uh, Juliet Lewis. Yep, track number five. Here's a hot ride. All one word. Again, <laughs> this, yeah, one, this one. Rules this is too. <laughs> so. This is so awesome. It's like three back-to-back really good tracks on here. I would say. Yeah, yeah I I dug this track a lot. It uh, it had that. It, it's that super like early mid two thousands garage rock that was happening at the time, and uh, yeah, with like the girl vocals and everything, it it, it distorted her her vocals and stuff. It had that like. Uh, remind me of that uh, Melissa Auf Demar album that came out kind of around the same time. There was that like garage rock sort sort of vibe to it. And yeah, this is uh, yeah great energy on this one. I appreciated the uh, the up tempo ness of it. This the third single off of Always Outnumbered, Ever Outgunned, fe- as we mentioned, featuring Juliet Lewis and borrowing lyrics from Jimmy Webb's song "Up Up and Away in My Beautiful Balloon," which is like a easy listening song. I think. Oh yeah. The, the old the old classic up up and in, in in my balloon uh in my beautiful balloon uh my ni- my nice time balloon my nice time balloon uh with my buddy drummer hal blaine <laughs> that's how the song goes he uh, was every he was everywhere he was he was there as and the whole the whole wrecking crew they were they were hal up blaine in the carol k the other ones and the rest that, that's all the Wrecking Crew people I could think of. 
Oh wait, wasn't Doctor John in the Wrecking Crew at one point? No, he he uh, his tummy hurt that day. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm full of facts. I'm sorry. Yes, you are. Disappointing facts. I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, um, don't mind if I'm a little, you know, silent during this one. Um, I'm trying to look up what was the year that Electro Clash really started being a thing. Oh, that that probably would have been around the same time because I remember, like, I want to say 2003, 2004 ish. That's when all those acts like Fisher Spooner and Peaches like La Tigre were all starting to come out of the woodwork. So do you think that with this song, you know, Prodigy really felt fell in line when it comes to the popularity, you know, quote unquote popularity of Electro Clash? Maybe. I mean, like the Ping Pong Twins we mentioned earlier are an Electro Clash group. So there's at least some of that influence going into it a little bit. And... I mean, like I said, I don't know Princess Superstar as an artist, but, like, the lyrics that she's doing on, you know, on Memphis Bells really seem very reminiscent of, like, Electro Clash, since it was, like, really just sexually charged electronic music yeah, at the time. Yeah, her and uh, Felix the Housecat, mm. uh, another producer who had uh, done some Electro Clash. And Electro Clash, um, to me, is another genre is another genre next to Big Beat and many others that takes the rock energy and applies it to um, applies it to electronic music. Mm. Only they're not just taking the energy, but also kind of trying to glamorize its ex its excess in a way. Mm. This one, uh, Electro Clash, is really trying to be a little bit more like the glam rock. Oh, I can I can absolutely see that, especially with acts like Fisher Spooner, who for like was very much as much about the image as the music for the a group. Dirty, like that. hypersexual, drugged out, you know, mi- you know, middle finger kind of music. Yeah. That, that's what <clears throat> So I think this is exactly what they were trying to what uh Prodigy had hit on when they collaborated with Juliet Lewis. I but can see that. In ter- All right. And I still haven't told you whether or not I actually like the song. <laughs> uh, I, <don't>, <laughs> I, I was uh, when not really. I understand from that point of view, but still not a big fan of it, honestly. Hmm. Interesting. Like it. <clears throat> yeah, it was going for the exact punk energy that uh, Juliet puts in her own music. But as a song is like, uh, yeah, that that's not not a big fan, honestly. Mm. Well, you know what I always say: Fisher Spooner damn near killed him. You have never said that, Pat. Listen, but this this is a comedy podcast too. Like, I, we got to throw in some jokes somewhere, okay? Like, they're counting the the people at Apple are counting the jokes now. They they're they're docking it from my pay, okay? Wait, you get paid? <laughs> oh I shit! I wasn't supposed. I to don't tell get you paid. <laughs> I, I I don't I don't either. Uh, nope, I oh, don't. Okay, very uh, well. Never mind then. Cancel check. Glad yeah, we settled that. It is halfway through this album that I'm wondering if this is going to be a battle for years to come. Is electronic music always going to have to figure out a way to pick up the slack of rock and roll, and thus there being a battle between you know synths and samplers and guitar, bass, and drums? Well, I mean. That seems to be the case more and more, especially when you hear just how languid most modern mainstream rock has become. Yeah, that's a lot. Of, a lot of that is the production trends too, and it's like half of modern big budget rock bands are are so electronically produced. Those drums are going through like however many compressors, and are you know half of them are triggered samples, and yeah, I don't know, and it's everything is melodyne to shit. So like everything is getting thrown through midi at, at one point or another. So, and the, the ones that know. aren't, that are like it's their own fault, the ones that aren't, that are like burning up the billboard mainstream rock charts just aren't very good. It's like, Oh yeah. Friggin' bad wolves is going to save rock music. Okay. Who? <laughs> <laughs> they were the band. That's dumb. They were the band that did that awful cover of zombies by cranberries. Oh, God. Remember that? Yeah. 
those big bad wolves. Um, let's move on to track number six, Wake Up Call. Back on tour, one, two, three, we are back on four, you better wake up. The streak has ended. Ah, uh, yeah, it's it's alarm. Oh, there's a word. <laughs> yeah, there's a word ended for you. <laughs> yeah, the alarm uh, clocks were a little on the of, nose. <laughs> kind of. I mean, once again, that's an interesting like swing to just like sample alarm clocks as percussion, but it kind of falls into you know what I was talking about earlier about how about it just kind of meandering for a bit, and like that like this is what makes me think that this album is a little bit front loaded because. They're just all these just track after track after track of like really big energy, big hitting sort of stuff like Hot Ride, Get Up, Get Off, Memphis Bell, Spitfire, Girls. And then from like this track onward, it's just kind of just kind of wandering aimlessly for me. Yeah, I, I wasn't nuts about this one either. Uh, and yeah, I, th- I think they I you mentioned this in, in our chat. Uh, they, they definitely kind of whiffed it on on utilizing cool keith he could have been utilized in a much better way uh oh yeah like and they they had cool keith on previous prodigy tracks he was on like one of the best tracks on fat of the land diesel Power. yeah that's a great track and i remember that one yeah and like here and on his other appearance like he doesn't really do it much except for just sort of repeating the hook and for like for an artist like Cool Keith, that just feels unacceptable. That just feels like you're underutilizing him. I mean, it's it's Doctor Octagon for fuck's sake. You don't know who that is. Yeah, I've heard of him. <laughs> okay, I know who he is. And Doctor <laughs> Doom. And that, I'm sorry. I was really uh, one of my things I like to do is um, these days when performing is I like to. I'm not performing live. Is freestyle and i was going to try and make up like a mock a dr Oc- dr octagon rhyme <laughs> to try and answer that a mocktagon uh, yep i was i was gonna try i was gonna, gonna try go and be that. cool keith for just a minute but i'm like eh, just let it go so what about the song <laughs> yeah i mean i the, i don't think the song is bad necessarily but after so many big hits in a row I'm just kind of underwhelmed. Yeah, I, I'm kind of in the same boat as you. So you felt like um, it's kind of like boxing. You let some people hit you hard, but you know the more they keep going, the more you're just tiring themselves out at this point. Yeah, that's so a the way, more that's that you tire them out. So if they further tire themselves out trying to hit as hard, you know, it just leaves it easier to just completely strike them. Yeah, that's a way of putting it. Like they basically just sort of shot their wad early and used up all their really big punches. And, like, it's probably debatable how much you agree with that, but that's kind of how I feel because none of the tracks moving forward really excited me in the same way that any of the previous tracks did. I don't know how what I thought when I was listening to it in... I think I was listening to it in high school. I don't know whether it's high school or middle school that I heard um, that I was really, really listening to this album. But... <clears throat> I really, I enjoyed it. I like it. Hmm. It's it's it got, fine. It, it got things me. back to perspective. <clears throat> it brought things back uh, for me. Um, yeah, I don't really have a bad word to say about the song. Hmm. All right, here's track number seven. This one titled "Action Radar." This one featuring vocals from Paul Dirt Candy Jackson and Luis Boone once again. Uh, this song supposedly was influenced by early hip hop music. I'm not quite sure if I get that, and I'm not sure if I agree that we're back personally. Uh, yeah. So there's a couple things. I mean, about this track that there there is like this opening uh, sound like a, like a harmonized vocal or something like that. It, it, it's a very uh, annoying sample. Uh, uh, or instrument that was being used, but 
but then uh, the the chord progression I thought was kind of like fun and interesting. So I I liked that part. Uh, so I, I had mixed feelings on this one. Uh, so in a way we're back, but in another way I'm also uh, not wanting to be engaged with that sound that made my tummy hurt. Hmm. Well, I mean, once again, I feel like there are a lot of interesting swings being taken here, and I appreciate those, but for one reason or another, it's just not really coming together for me. And, like, this definitely feels like a song that, in a live setting, would be, you know, amazing. But just as a studio recording, for one reason or another, it's just not connecting with me. Which, incidentally, uh, of all 12 tracks on Always Outnumbered, Never Outgunned, after the initial tour, Prodigy would only ever play uh, Spitfire on this track, Action Radar, live ever again. The other ones, they just kind of... Yeah, and the reason that's why I said, and we're back, is because... Uh, I don't know if I've discussed it through the whole podcast already, but <clears throat> bringing up Electro Clash... Oh, yeah, it I'd does honestly, kind of... I'd honestly, and that's probably because of my, you know, overall perception based upon all the electric clash that I've been listening to um, throughout my life. But I'd say, you know, this, you know, hits the idea on the head. Mm. I personally prefer this, you know, don't kill me. I personally prefer this over Hot Ride. Oh, man. That is, In terms that is of a big, the song that sounds, that is a big like swing. This, that's a song that kind of takes the pastiche of rock music. And it sounds like it's not really trying to be serious rock. It's, it's not trying to take itself too seriously. It's obviously taking more like the very in your face, you know, <laughs> kind of idea of rock music and just put it in your face, but turn it into an electronic song. Applied directly and, to um, face. <laughs> and I really think that they have, hit the mark and making something that is meant to be you know fun and made and uh in your face about how you know mm. it's employing rock pass um is pastiche the right word to use oh sorry rock aesthetics the kind of obnoxiousness of rock aesthetics mm. pa pastiche is like an imitation of a specific style so I was on the right track with that word. Yeah, it was close enough, I would say. Uh, interchangeable. I, I can see all of that, but it still didn't really, like, hit me all that much compared to some of the other tracks. Um, I think that's one of the... Oh, sorry. sorry. I'm sorry. I think that's one of the reasons as to why I like Action Radar, because it's mm. obvious that the track is playing around with the idea of rock being very, like, black. It's playing with... Blah. Come on now. You're playing with the idea that it's very stick your tongue out, very it's playing with the obnoxiousness of rock sure. and roll and make it making that sound fun as opposed to really trying at all to employing something about uh, rock and roll. It's it's not very easy to try and take <clears throat> I don't think it's very easy to really take something about rock and make it obvious that you're not serious and make that sound good, make it sound anywhere outside yeah. of, you know, novelty and stupid. Yeah, without, 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 without sounding, sounding really, really obnoxious. obnoxious. Without sounding as obnoxious as the characteristics that you're trying to employ within the song. Yeah, I but can see I, that. I, But I think, I, I think they um, may, have, may have hit it with that one. Hmm. That's me, though. Fair enough. I, I've heard, uh, I hear well, elements of what you're talking about, and I heard it on other tracks, uh, too, and it was like kind of what I enjoyed about them. I, I totally get that. Uh, should we head on to track number eight? Medusa's Path. Sure. Yep. But we, got, we can't look at her because we'll turn to Puddin. Yeah. <laughs> This that one song I is begging to be in a video game. Oh, 
for sure. Like this is totally the soundtrack to like some kind of futuristic kart racer or something like that. Or maybe like an Unreal Tournament style tournament shooter. Yeah, I liked this one. And, and uh, it's like mostly instrumental, if not completely or something, right? It is. It's completely instrumental. Yeah, yeah. This is this was just a Howlett Mc, uh, McLellan joint. Uh, yeah, I, I liked the journey of this one. It it uh, it was uh, it was a lot of fun and and like without there being vocalists there to pick up the slack, it's like they had to sort of make the arrangement interesting. Yeah, uh, they had to a bit more interesting, and I, I I appreciated what they did. Yeah, they had to set more of an atmosphere and not just rely <laughs> on like you know lyrics or anything like that. Yeah. And like it's based or like whatever the sample was that it's based around that has that very old timey like 1930s, 1920s, 1940s y kind of song. Kind of reminded me of uh, you know that song "Your Woman" by uh, White Town. Oh yeah, 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 for sure. With the yeah, the Imperial March yeah. on trumpet. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, I can't come back to that. <laughs> I, I just ruined that song, didn't I? I like it. Sorry. It's fine. I'm, I feel like maybe Medusa's Path might have benefited from just sort of like cutting some of the fat a little bit. But on yeah, the whole, long. but on the whole, like, I mean, it's long for not really, you know, varying itself up all that much. But on the whole, I think I like Medusa's Path just as a, just in general. <clears throat> ten out of I ten. do too. And I think, I think it may have been because the more that I listen to the music, the more <coughs> it sounds like it's really begging to be in a video game. Like mm. um, Tomb Raider, Angelina Jolie's Tomb Raider has two movies. Both of them have soundtracks. And I'm like, so you have U2's Elevation. You have uh, Nine Inch Nails. You have Deep. Outcast. Uh, you have all that. Medusa's path could be, could fit right in there with fluke and and all the rest of that stuff. Oh, totally. Hell, it it could be uh, in um, both Matrix soundtrack. It was begging to be in a in a soundtrack that has something to do with um, to be in an action films soundtrack, which I really really miss. Yeah, in the in the same vein as like uh, like how Mindfields was on the soundtrack to the Matrix. Yes. Oh, man. So before we move on to track number nine, I feel like we'd be remiss if I didn't play like a clip from uh, Baby's Got a Temper because that's basically the single that that single is basically the entire reason why Always Outnumbered, Never Outgunned, you know, exists in the first place. All right, let me just get that. Let me just cue that up. This one, this was released as a non-album single in July 2002. Um, it was our first release after dancer Leroy Thornhill left the band. You can hear like Keith Flint on the vocals. It's not very good. <coughs> and apparently it introduced the idea, at least to me, of Rehypnol, which I later yeah, found that's... is a date rape drug. Oh yeah, that's especially not good. Oh, I mean... Yeah. I will I will cop that it definitely sounds closer to the Prodigy's signature sound than a lot of the stuff on Always Outnumbered, Never Outgunned. But I also it's think not- this I also think this might have been the point where like Liam Howlett and company just sort of realized, okay, maybe we need to ta- maybe we need to tamper back like all the sort of smack my bitch up edginess a little bit because no nobody likes this song with date rape drug lyrics in it, and I would say rightly so. Yeah, I would say so too. Jesus Christ, I'm, I, I was just reading about it as, as well on my end here. It, that's uh, as I understand. As I great. understand. As I understand it, this was adapted from like a uh, song that Keith Flint wrote with his solo punk band Flint, and I really hope that he got a stern talking to afterwards. <laughs> I'm sure he did too. I, I hope HR. Uh, <sighs> dealt with it. Yeah, I hope. I hope the HR at Prodigy Inc. took him aside. At the company Christmas party. It, I mean, all 
mention of drugs aside, it certainly would have sounded like um, they were revisiting ideas of federal. It would feel like they were repeating themselves. Yeah, because, I can see that. Because the fat of the land already had that, you know, shocking, supposedly shocking uh, punk energy. They they already have this um, that something with it, and baby's got a temper. Would have felt felt like, I think somebody said it wouldn't sounded like self parody. Uh, but I I see where they went with that, which is why I understood they had to jettison the whole project and figure out a way to completely start again. Yeah, yeah, I if can you're, see that. If you're a prodigy, if you're Liam Howlett, the, the last thing you want to do is repeat yourself. Yeah, as I understand it, the intention of like Liam Howlett just picking the whole thing up by himself without any input from Keith Flint and Maxim Reality, like the intent as I understand it was to get back to the original sound of albums like Jilted Generation and Experience, you know, the very early sort of before they got into sort of punky big beat, which I mean, and there's several like punky beat, big beat, uh, yeah. punky, <laughs> punk, punky, big beats. punky Brewster. Let's try that again. <laughs> there's several punk infused big beat songs on this album anyway. So I'm not really sure. Like if that, I'm not, I, if not really sure if it worked or not, I don't know. Is there even a going back once she gets famous? Mm, like pro- um, probably not. <laughs> Like, if you had a sound that uh, brought you somewhere, but you have your biggest album, The Fat of the Land, uh, do you, uh, is there a going back to basics, going back to your old sound once people, once you blew up off of what you had right there? I, think I, don't, imag- I don't imagine so, because you got to imagine that, like, those first couple of albums were made in, like, the circumstances that they were made in aren't really things that can be replicated, partic- like especially after the amount of success that Prodigy already had. Yeah, I think uh, it kind of varies from artist to artist too, depending on how they handle fame and, and like what their relationship to it is. Uh, and I mean, also just like trends change. Uh, it's hard to even say that it's like necessary for them to like go back to what they were doing in 1994 because you know things had kind of moved on mm. uh, i'm also not very familiar with that uh album at all jilted generation and by not very i mean uh completely not. unfamiliar <laughs> i really need to start listening to their old stuff um i've only ever listened to their uh, singles, but I'm pretty sure you know the album's experience and music from the Jilted Generation uh, bang just as hard. Oh, they're they're worth checking out. Experience is a little bit uneven in places, but music from the Jilted Generation is a stone cold classic front to back. It's another, fa- it's like another fat of the land. Not quite like in sound, but in terms of like you know just how hard it hits. Anyway. Uh, let's move on to track number nine because we're on a time limit. <laughs> oh yeah, shit. Here's track number nine titled Phoenix. So you know how you were saying that like the alarm clock was really annoying in Wake Up Call and like that kind of breathy <laughs> synths were really annoying in Action Radar? That bleh that keeps popping in on Phoenix is really annoying to me. And it's yeah. the one like, like, I mean, otherwise it's an okay song, but just the extent to which that just keeps popping up. And I'm not against like, you know, dissonant synths in the slightest, but something about this one just really just agitates me well it it heavily lifts from a shocking blue song which was a uh like a psychedelic band uh love buzz which nirvana also covered that song on their first album bleach really i didn't Uh, know that they're the same band that does uh fucking venus uh the original one not the the banana rama one oh interesting yeah, not, that's about all I have to say about this song. <laughs> so otherwise, I don't really have much else to say. I mean, I, I can't. 
Oh, sorry. Go on. I, I'm kind of in a similar boat. Like I already mentioned that synth kind of bugs me, but it has a per like, I think the sample gets used pretty well. And I like that sort of Middle Eastern instrumentation that keeps popping up. But on the whole, there's really not a whole lot much to this one worth mentioning as far as I'm concerned. I like this. This is one of those tracks that really, I really enjoyed it when I first heard it. I'm not saying it's as bad now. It's, <clears throat> I don't, I don't know. <clears throat> it used to be one of, it was one of my um, personal favorite tracks of the album. Hmm. Interesting pick. I don't know. It, it's it's just something about the pacing of the song. It's, it's like very uh, shifty, but. Mm. I can kind of see that just because of how much the beat changes from like that sort of main beat where it's just this kind of doom, 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 gee, doom, 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 gee, occasionally just sort of stopping into like a doom, gee, doom, gee, gee, doom, gee, something a little more breakbeaty at times. I think that is where you now I wasn't really you know messing around with the track hmm. when uh, when I guess I can understand the uh, change of the beat, but it wasn't really my favorite moment of the album. Hmm. <clears throat> it wasn't my favorite moment of the song, but I think it's just everything else that I was enjoying more. Hmm. All right, should we move on to track ten? Let's do it. All right, here's track number 10, another cool Keith collabo. You'll be under my wheels. Oh and I may have lied about um, Phoenix being my uh, personal favorite. Uh, really? Once you put on one, two, once you put on, you will be under my wheels. I think that was the one. Really? That's another? Yeah, that's another track that I think was really begging to be. Per perhaps you know, there's a whole lot of like Middle Eastern um, things injected into the music, and it just makes me think uh, video game music. Oh, that, it's funny you mentioned that. This actually was used in a video game. It's part of the soundtrack to the 2005 racing game Need for Speed Most Wanted. Oh, I love that game. Is that the one where you got to, like, uh, I think that's the one where you crash the car. Oh, no, never mind. That was Burnout. Never mind. I don't like this game. I don't like this. <laughs> and, and we lost Pat. Oh, my goodness. But, yeah, um... What can I really say about this uh, about this track? I I was messing around with the beat. I, I really I really enjoyed this track. I um, mean, I liked it just fine. Oh, sorry, sorry. And it's it's screwed up that I can't really explain to you why. But I but this was uh this was the personal favorite. Hmm. Interesting. Like, I thought it was a perfectly fine track. Like, I liked what it, like where the beats went, that kind of, like, you know, synthetic guitar solo that kept on popping up. But once again, like, they just waste Cool Keith here, and that just really fundamentally annoys me. And it's really hard for me to overlook that. Is this the one that actually has Keith Flint singing on it? Yeah, he sings... Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. This is no, I, Cool no, I don't, Keith saying, I rock, I roll. Yeah, Keith Flint does not appear on the record. Oh, right. He only does vocals on the Hot Ride Elbatory mix. I, I apologize. I should have been keeping up. You've got Wikipedia open, don't you? Maybe. There's no <laughs> way you would have known this otherwise. Sometimes I, I just, it gives me things to talk about. I, I mean, that's perfectly fine. Uh, should we move on to track number 11? Yeah, I guess so. I didn't really have much else to say about You'll Be Under My Wheels. I thought uh, my my assessment was it um, it sounds like a Prodigy track for sure, like as in it, it it's uh, pretty like closely, you know, tied to, to that sort of arrangement of, of uh, like the heavy synths and, and the repetition and, and whatnot. Uh, yeah. Uh, 
it just didn't do it for me, I guess. Uh, mm. I don't really know why. Do you think? Sorry. Do you think um, you'll be under my wheels? Is basically always outnumbered minefields. Hmm. Is that I like mean, minefield yeah. part two? For you? That's a good. That's actually a good point. Minefields has that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, it does kind of have a similar vibe to it with that like Middle Eastern synth and, and minefields. I can kind of see that a little bit and also kind of not just because Maxim Reality does the vocals on the on Minefields and I feel like he does more than cool I shouldn't I shouldn't keep harping on this but it just annoys me so much that all they're having Cool Keith do is hooks. I mean um I guess they weren't really bringing him in to redo diesel power. Yeah, I guess not. I mean, for all I know, maybe he just happened to be walking through and they were just like, hey, you want to do the thing? And he was like, okay, I'm Cool Keith. I rock, I roll. All right, where's my 20 bucks? I'm Cool Keith. I rock, I roll. I think he actually said, I rock, roll, and they just used the I from the I rock phrase. And Could have been. You think, <laughs> I don't know whether, it sounds to me like a sample. Uh, it's one of, it might be one of those pioneering ideas where they just, you know, put you as a feature if they just sample your stuff. Cause there's no way that they just brought them in just for that. I'm sure they copied and pasted it. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know because like I've looked up, you know, I've been trying to look up where all the samples are coming from and there's nothing listed under you'll be under my wheels. Like it doesn't list a previous cool Keith song or Dr. Octagon or Dr. Doom or anything like that. Which really, the fact that it doesn't list a sample just leads me to believe, yes, this was recorded for this track. And like, if that's the case, then that that that's really all you're doing? Unless they were able to just sort of bang that out and his uh, vocals and wake up call just in the same day. Which you, you need, you need all day for that. Yeah, I mean... Well, that, that's not true. Cool Keith has a pretty uh, strict evening and afternoon regiment. Uh, he heads down and, and has uh, a feast <laughs> around lunchtime, and then he goes home uh, and plays bocce with his family because he, he is Italian. He's, he's very Italian. Don't you forget that. I don't, I don't think he's Italian, Pat. His, his, yeah, his, name is, his, his full name is uh, Coolio. Uh, no. He, no, his Keith his Oli. full name is not cool. His full name is not Coolio Keith Oli. Keith Yoli, sorry, uh, and he's very tied. Uh, what are you doing to, this, to the country of? Italy. Please stop this. <laughs> okay, sorry, I'm just going off Wikipedia here. No, you are most definitively not. Oh wait, oh Stinkopedia. Who <laughs> who opened up Stinkopedia? That was me. I opened up Stinkopedia. Oh, boy. <laughs> Let's here's move track, on. <laughs> here's, track, here's track number 11, The Way It Is. Uh, this one was, uh, this one was fine. Not much yeah. to say about this one, except that I feel like it's just trying to repeat what they did earlier with girls. I don't know. It has kind of a similar vibe to it. I would say it reminds me. Oh, well, first of all, it's fucking thriller by Michael Jackson being, Oh yeah. That's, that's worth mentioning. That definitely takes some balls to like sample such a huge Michael Jackson song. Yeah. That, that took serious cojones. And, uh, but it also like, arrangement instrumentally reminded me of uh that daft punk song uh which short circuit yeah yeah one one of those off of uh well actually i've singing one of the ones off uh human after all uh which hmm. kind of for, for me as as a uh like a <sighs> electronic idiot I'm, I'm getting like similar vibes between those two albums uh between this one hmm. and human after all uh, just I can like kind of see that space between their like big record of like the late nineties, early two thousands into adjusting into the mid aughts and, and all the, the pitfalls that came with that. I'd honestly say this was uh, one of my least favorites. Um, it, it may be the stickler in me as uh, someone who also makes electronic music from time to time. 
<laughs> but when I first heard this, I'm like, oh, this is Michael Jackson's thriller. I don't know. I'm, I'm, whenever it seems like you're using a way too obvious sample, and I can pretty much see that this is a remix, I'm like, okay, so this is just a Michael Jackson remix. Um, it's to me, I'm usually I'm used to someone taking the song. If they want to take Thriller, you know, chop it up, stretch it, completely destroy it to the point where I will not recognize this is just Michael Jackson Thriller remix. I, I can see that. And like using such an obvious sample so blatantly, I feel like kind of strikes of, and like I don't want to assume that this is what was going through Liam Hallett's head, but it strikes of like this kind of, we'll use this thing everyone recognizes so that way everyone else will associate that with this and we'll get the same, you know, the same plaudits. Yeah, but it didn't quite pan out that way, did it? Cause nope, not, not particularly, no. I, I don't, I've never heard this song. Uh, oh, we got Louise Boone is back. All right, sure. Yeah, I'm not really <clears throat> sure where she pops up. I can't find any information on her. I'm just going to assume that uh, she's a vampire. All right. I'm a, that's just what keeps happening. Stop. <laughs> Any, anytime something weird goes on around here, I just assume it's vampire activity. Like yeah, between we, Gene we Applebaum a, and fucking... We have, we have a sordid history with vampires. Yeah, between, you know, Timmy Kissy Face and, and uh, you know, Gene Applebaum. And, and apparently, apparently Steinberg was a vampire, too. Detective. Really? Yeah. And you know who killed him? You know, Gene Applebaum was like, oh, very concerned with, with who killed Detective Steinberg. He fucking killed him. He was the one who did it. Returning why, to the crime. Why do we keep letting Gene Applebaum hang around? I don't know. I, it I seems really like he. Know. It seems like all he does is just murder people. Yeah, or just like turns them into vampires, or, or is I don't know. It, it's a long. It's a long story. I think I'll. I'll I. Uh, things will unfold over the next three episodes of the season and, and hopefully mm. we can get some closure, but uh, let's continue. Yeah. Well, yes, I'm sure. I'm sure whatever happens, it'll be completely worth it for, you know, milking this bit for the entirety of the season. Yeah. I'm totally not making I'm, it I'm sure, as I go along. I'm sure it will end in an incredibly satisfying way. I sure hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, the way it is, isn't that good. Um, <laughs> Should we go to the last track, Shoot Down? Oh, yeah, we got the boys. Ah, uh, yes, the lovable lads from Liverpool. No, that's not, though. That's not them. No, they're, they're from Manchester. Yep, track 12, Shoot Down, featuring Liam and Lowell. <sighs> Let me try that again. Featuring Edmund. Liam and Noel <laughs> from Oasis. This is the clip. Featuring the only down. members of Oasis that you even remember. Yeah, pretty much. Unless you're like that big into Beatles history that you remember that one time that Zach Starkey was in the band. He, he's Ringo's son. Yeah. What about <laughs> Paul McGuigan? <laughs> Sorry, I have Wikipedia open. So there's not a whole lot to this one either. I would say, yeah, it's, an, it's another one of those songs that just kind of, that just kind of like starts at one point and then just spends the whole entirety of the song just getting to the end point, without a whole lot of, you know, twists and turns. I would yeah, say it, it reminds me a bit too much of "Smack My Bitch Up," just with like more lyrics. I guess I'm still hearing the, I'm like I'm, I'm still hearing that vibe. Yeah, I guess it's like a little too much for me. I, yeah, Liam Howlett couldn't bring himself to stray too far in that instance, I guess. It's a bit too derivative, I guess, for me. It's bringing things back to, um, back full circle from Spitfire, I think. A little bit, yeah. Spitfire start with a punch in the face, and it's trying to end, you know, with the same energy. Hmm. I'm not sure if it quite hits the same way that Spitfire does. That's what I got. But the question is, 
is it better than Chemical Brothers Setting Sun, which has Noel Gallagher on it? Oh, hell no. I fucking love Setting Sun. Like, I genuinely think that song is the best thing that Noel Gallagher has ever done. <laughs> that, Let Forever Be. Yeah. But Noel Gallagher and um, the Chemical Brothers are just... Yeah, what, that's, what a match made in, that's a match made in heaven. So I want to play a really quick clip because, like, you actually made mention of it in our chat, so I felt like... I couldn't really let the episode slip by without just sort of, without bringing that up. Um, this song ends, interestingly. Here, here's, here's, how it, here's how the whole thing just sort of wraps up in a neat little bow. I mean, <laughs> that wasn't, Liam warned you. <laughs> that wasn't an edit. That's literally how it ends. Oh yeah, that that was uh, <coughs> that was abrupt. The first time I heard it, I thought it was uh, like damaged. I, I thought it ended in the way that is like damaged. I'm like, this is how it ends. Oh, like, oh, Liam, how did what what? <laughs> <laughs> that, like, <Arnold> <laughs> Wait a minute. Well, why don't we make make the album sound like it's <laughs> so broken out there and, and, and then people have to go say, back and buy the buy the new one at the store and then we're gonna that say one, time's oh, running out and then it'll run out. It's like poetry. <laughs> and, the, and then they picked up the CD's broken, so they gotta go back to the record shop and, and buy like another one, and then I, they bring that one home and that one's broken and I, I have to imagine that like in the moment like th- that like I have to imagine in the moment that that was an instance of Liam Gallagher just like you know, he gives so many takes of running out, running out, running out, and then just abruptly pulls the cord on the equipment. It's just like, that's it, that's all you're getting from me. Bye. You didn't have, you didn't have to unplug everything, Liam. Boy, yeah, Liam. but I'm a jerk. <laughs> My name's Liam too. We really could rock, make our own band called the Liams and fuck no. Oh, I'm right here playing bass, mate. Yeah, we could so form a band called the Liam Buddies. <laughs> Liam Buddies. So obnoxious <laughs> to get on to sing their songs about how what good friends they are. Like, cool, we get it. You guys got any final thoughts on this song? <laughs> no. Or rather, do you guys think that? Oh, I, I should probably wait until like after that question answer. Sure. So you think you think we should get to our final thoughts then? Yeah, I think mm-hmm. it's time. Do you think they brought the guns on this one? Uh, yes, uh, Pat. Do you think this is the worst of all time? And do you think this is a worst of all time album? And did they bring the guns on this one? I think no. It's not a worst of all time album. Uh, and this is going from someone who's have a, who's you know coming in from a pretty objective stance on the prodigy in general. I'm, I think overall I'm like pretty uh, indifferent on them. So no, it, it it's not a worst of all time, and and it's actually downright listenable at points. And and there's, and there's some good like dance moments. It's not something I'm going to revisit anytime soon, but it it does what it does, and, and it sounds like prodigy doing their thing. Why not? They brought the guns. I think they, I think a few guns were brought. Uh, same question. Um, oh, same question for you, Blue Sky. Do you think this is a worst of all time record? And did they bring the guns? It is not the worst of all time. And yeah, yeah. Uh, should I? I finally have the quote right here. If I could read it. Oh okay. yeah, go for it. So for those who own the Fat of the Land CD and have uh, read inside the booklet it says we have no butter but i ask you would you rather have butter or guns shall we import lard or steel let me tell you preparedness makes us powerful butter merely makes us fat now what are the guns the guns that's the real estate the stocks and bonds artwork you know shit that appreciates with value what's the butter cars clothes jewelry all that other bullshit that don't mean shit after you buy it that's what it's all about guns and butter baby i mean yeah but on the other hand 
Butter's pretty good. Well, you know what they say. Uh, uh, hard, hard times create guns. Guns create good times. Good times create butter. <laughs> Who butter says that? Bad times. Who says that? I don't know. Nobody. Some some fucking and cap on Reddit. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well then. Yeah, uh, I had sent the whole um, guns and butter thing that was from Baby Boy, and basically what they're trying to say is guns is anything that is. Um, something that appreciates with value. So the more, so it's, guns is something that is supposed to be important. It's supposed to be significant and it might make you a little bit more money. Whereas butter uh, is not important. It has a whole lot of things that don't mean a whole lot of things and certainly won't make you a whole lot after you buy it. It's, it's just so a guess, passing fancy. It's just a passing fancy as opposed to something with a little more staying power. Yeah. So I'm thinking that when Prodigy, Prodigy was talking about Guns and Butter, they're like, you know, we don't have this kind of music that is here today, God tomorrow. It has absolutely no real relevance. But we have the kind of music that we guarantee is going to be remembered in like 10 or 20 years to come. I mean, maybe, maybe there'll be like a big, uh, you know, a big sort of reconsideration on this album. I think. Um... Like the electronic duo Justice, in like an interview with Mix, in like an interview with Mix Mag, they named this one of, they named this one of the best electronic albums that you've never heard. Yeah. Um, so so it, so it's reaching someone. Yeah. And plus, I have read reviews before this one, and they say there's a whole lot of reviews saying that this album might sound better if, if it might sound a whole lot better than it did if only it did not come so late at a time where people were jettisoning uh, electronic music for rock music again. Hmm. And I'm like, I wouldn't be so sure, because as we discussed, right around the time that Prodigy dropped, that's when Electro Clash was picking up steam. Hmm. So I'd say that they uh, fell in, you know, in some ways fell in with that genre, that popularity pretty well. So Hmm. it's, it's not late. It may be late in terms of trying to be ahead of the curb, but you know you don't really need to be ahead of the curb as long as you're right on time for the genre that is you know currently picking steam. Like you're right here. Mm. Very true. Uh, okay. Um, as for me, I don't believe it's a worst of all time record, but this full album re-listen has put all kinds of question in my head about how much I truly still love this record as compared to in my youth. Like I'm appreciative of all the big swings it's taken and I can see all the evidence of like future influence on later subgenres of electronic music. But like I said, like some tracks, some tracks just hit really, really well and others just kind of, just kind of meander about a little bit. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna leave it at a happy medium. And I would say, yes, they brought guns, but maybe, the wrong kind of guns they brought the nerf guns they brought the nerf guns to a sport gun fight the nail gun oh you don't want to bring a nail gun to a nerf fight <laughs> oh that's terrible no then they will win <laughs> yeah that yeah but they will they really win though uh what would you say uh. is <laughs> what would you say is the best or least bad track on the record pat that's a good question uh i kind of uh, had trouble picking one. I, I think uh, all in all, I'm going to go with Hot Ride. I, I, it's funny. I wasn't a hundred percent on that when I first heard it, but uh, hearing it again, like right now, hearing all the hooks and everything again, uh, it's it's funny. Like for for me, I'm I'm coming in from an objective angle, so I'm kind of looking out for the tracks that just stick out to me. Uh, like from a musical standpoint and uh, not so much from like this is an example of the prodigy doing what they do best or this is like an advancement or a growth on their previous record so like my opinion almost doesn't really matter <laughs> in some way <laughs> uh, but I think yeah Hot Ride was just the, it was the most interesting and exciting and, and had the most PB appeal Peanut Butter? Uh, yeah, Pat Barry, P 
peanut butter. Uh, same question for you, Blue Sky. Uh, what is your best or least bad track? Uh, good grief. I'd, I'd personally say... Um, I'd personally say Medusa's Path, personally. Um, Spitfire, sorry. Spitfire is the best. Mm. Um, for, um, as for the worst... Oh, that, that's, um, that's coming next. Uh, for sorry? me... That, that, that's coming next. Uh, my okay. personal best, least bad track is uh, I Gotta Give It to Hot Right as well. I love that song. I spin it pretty regularly at Goth Industrial Nights. It's, it's, a, it's a real corker. Um, no tapper. What would you say is the worst track, Pat? Ooh. Uh, yeah, uh, I think, so, sorry to do this, uh, Blue Sky, I gotta go with You'll Be Under My Wheels. Uh, it's just the one that uh, I connected with the least for whatever reason. It just uh, was kind of boring for me. Okay. Uh, same question for you, Blue Sky. Uh, what is your least favorite track or what, what was the worst track? I'd say I'm going to want, um, I'd probably say God, what, it's a mix between Hot Riot. Well, I, I don't think Hot Riot is the worst. No. You just tempted to say that <laughs> because it's our favorite. Um, now, the more that I think about it, the more I'm saying um, I'm not really a big fan of girls. Girl, girls mm. is okay. It, it's it's merely okay to me. I'm gonna say my worst track is the way it is. It's because it did so. Oh incredibly damn! Little. I forgot about the way it is. Well, that that just speaks to how bad a track it is. Then. I'm sorry. I could not get past. You for- well, like you, you forgot it existed because it just does so little. You did say that earlier uh, when we were discussing that track that it was one of your least favorites. So uh, yeah, only we do some copy and paste. The um, <laughs> thing is too is way too obvious. Like it feels like the track. I am. It sounds like it's a remix that is tacked upon an album. Mm. I, yeah, I would. I would agree. Uh, that one's pretty weak, too. <laughs> Uh, you know what's not weak, though? Our guest, my name is Blue Sky. Thanks for coming back on the program. Yay, thank you so much. Uh, uh, do you have anything you want to plug real quick? Well, just last night, I had a fairly successful, amongst friends, <laughs> um, concert that I drew for Autistic Pride Day. Awesome. Yesterday was Autistic Pride Day, and... I curated the show with Pro Art Gallery. Awesome! Yeah, I, I saw the, I, I saw that you were doing that uh, last night. That's great. And people show up and really enjoy the artists. There's Moscow's, Robin plays chords, Savant de Paul, and Censored Dialogue, who is <coughs> who was also releasing their album afro pessimist the very uh, the next day it's out now excellent uh you got and, any uh, oh, sorry people really enjoyed it so right now if you want to go see it go see it now but it's about to be taken off so we can get a uh, re-release a re you know a reviewing for those who probably didn't make it no oh awesome. excellent and that where's that going to be is that going to be on youtube or I think it'll be on YouTube or Twitch. Uh, I will try and release some uh, information concerning that later. But because of the success of that, um, shows concerning autism, uh, autistic artists might be uh, done bi monthly. We're talking about that. So oh, I have very that cool. coming up. Very cool. Uh, Pat, do you have anything that you want to plug real quick? Uh, not this time. I, I, I'll have more things soon, but, uh, yeah, let's just, uh, let's wrap it up. Yeah. I don't really have anything either. So I'll just say, go check out the other zero science shows on our network. Uh, our theme song is sunny day by the band Froggy and the friendship. You can check them out at froggy and the friendship dot band If oh, you had out, oh. If, oh, sorry. I'm so sorry. Oh, there is one more thing. Tear garden records a record label that has <clears throat> released some music by those who are neurodivergent, mostly those who are um, on the autism spectrum, released um, No Ordinary Summer, an album that I released last year, 
more like cassette tape. So if you want to take a listen, uh, you can go on ahead or uh, buy the tape. Awesome. We've been playing that on On the Town with Mikey D, I believe. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. I've played a couple tracks already. Anyway, if you have an album you'd like to suggest for us to review or just would like to leave us some feedback or a comment, email us at jukeboxzeroespodcast at gmail.com. Uh, you can also find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash jukeboxzeroespodcast or on Twitter at twitter.com slash jukeboxzeroes. Uh, you can find us, rate us, review us, and subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Amazon Music, or check out our archives at the Zero Science main page. Jukebox Zeros is a production of the Zero Science Network. For more great podcasts, go check out zero-science.com. And that about does it for this episode of Jukebox Zeros. I'm Lils. And I'm Patrick. And remember... <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> Got me out of that this time, thank I don't you. Even, I don't even <laughs> know what that was. Science.